Johnson here. Um, this is the, as Edie said, this is the first of these. Um, I'm known for more than anything doing writing the history of UK fandom. And UK fandom is now 90 years old. In fact, 90 years, it turned 90 years, years old on October the 27th, because the very first meeting of our very first fan group took place in Ilford on the 27th, Monday the 27th of October, 1930, at, at, uh, third, at Thorold Road in Ilford, and that was the Ilford Science Literary Circle. Um, after that, we got organized, and that's pretty much where this video starts, because as I was do and researching then, I obviously went out and ha had a physical look at where places were in London, because I live in London, why not? And I realized over time, the natural fact, I could put together a walk between a lot of these places that you could do in a reasonable amount of time. The walk obviously is geographical rather than chronological. I mean, where, where things appear on the line is just where they appeared on the line. Um, and I did, as I say, I did this for a number of years. When people visited me, we go for a drink, we go for the walk and we do it. Come the uh, Worldcon in 2014, um, it was suggested that I might like to put, do this as a tour for people who were interested, which I did. And uh, Edie and Joe were on that tour and they, and indeed was Mark, and they liked it enough that they asked me if we could do it online. So that's what we're doing now. So if you want to take it away, Edie. Okay. In January 1937, the 14 or so fans who gathered in Leeds for the first ever science fiction convention formed the Science Fiction Association. Eventually, later in that year, a London branch was formed. They had formal meetings, but from the end of the year, around about December, they started meeting informally, first at the, at the J. Lyon tea shop that was at 3638 New Oxford Street, occasionally moving next door to the Express Dairies at number 40. These meetings are the direct ancestor of the first Thursday London meetings that go to this day, and they were held on a Thursday because that's when Ted Carnell got a half day off. It's also why the Los Angeles Science Fantasy Society meets on a Thursday to this day. Our next stop takes us up Bloomsbury Way. So that was just a brief intro to the very first place that um, fans physically gathered in London. Which, and which were uh, say coffee shops. We didn't actually used to do, go in pubs back then. I don't quite know why. I suspect uh, it's not as if all those concerned were teetotal, but it's just coffee shops were more of a thing than for pubs then for young guys. The Kingsley Hotel, this magnificent building here, was the site of the 1960 Eastercon, which was unusual in that the hotel was only found a few days before the convention was due to be held due to the original hotel falling through. These days there would be contracts in place but back then there was nothing in writing to stop the original hotel backing out of the deal. As it happens this was a blessing in disguise because what no one had realized and it's almost too horrible to even contemplate a con being held in such condition was that the Sandringham was a teetotal hotel. The 1960 Easter con was held over the weekend of 15th to 18th of April. Taff winner Don Ford was in attendance. He did not approve when most of the attendees wandered down to Trafalgar Square on Sunday to greet the arrival of the annual anti-nuclear CND march from Aldermaston. It was a very sunny day, as can be seen from the photo of fans sitting on the steps of St. Martin in the Fields Church. This was the final convention attended by the Inchmary Group, joined Vince Clark and Sandy Sanderson. Although, since someone needed to stay home to look after baby Nicky, all three were never there at the same time. The group had been involved in the events that had split London fandom over the previous year, but would themselves break apart only two months later, when Sandy and Joy moved to the US and Vince Clark gaffiated, not to return until 1981. That convention, the 1960 Easter Con, had an all-female um, committee, consisting of Ella Parker, Sandra Hall and Bobby Gray. Again, just the three of them, that's all you needed back then. Um, and as I say, the, the original hotel of the Sandringham fell through on the Tuesday, and they had the con was starting on the Friday and they had people flying in from America as well. So it was all a bit of a mess. They had to send somebody to the Sandringham on the first day to meet anybody who hadn't got the news. And remember, back then there wasn't the Internet who hadn't got the news that uh, the hotel, the con had moved. It seems inconceivable these days, but that's the olden days for you. Edie, any questions about the con or anything? I had one. 
What Go was on. the what what happened the year before uh, the Inchmary fandom split up? Who said that all fandom was plunged into war somehow? Yeah, lo- there had been a lot of bad feeling being generated for various reasons in um, within London fandom, and you had but you had more or less. Um, Inchmary and one or two people on one side, and you had people, uh, old peak timers like Ted Tubb and um, Ken Bulmer, etc., on the other side. And they had, uh, they organized something in 1959 called the Symposium, which was supposed to bring together all the various factions that uh, of London fandom, but it actually ended up splitting London fandom. And the uh, Inchmary fandom and, and kind of their supporters went away and formed the Science Fiction Club of London, which eventually turned out to be one of the most important groups of the 1960s over here, since it was the Science Fiction Club of London that basically ran the 1965 Worldcon, among other things. Ella Parker, who had only come into fandom in, a, in 58 or thereabouts, so seven years later, she's kind of running our second Worldcon, which was fairly impressive. But then Ella Parker was the most important female fan of the 60s, well, the most important fan of the 1960s over here by a long way, I think. Peter West was probably the best known, but I think Ella Parker takes the, uh, takes the title. It's a bit difficult to imagine the 1960s having unfolded over here like they did without her, in fact. Any other questions? No, uh, okay. Yeah, uh, oh. Murray, do you wanna try unmuting or, or not? Rob, why? Why is this London Brackets Holborn fandom history? Because it is literally just that end of London. Plus, if I was going to do all of London, I mean, you could do a separate one of these, just about the, the three London World Cons, for instance, which might be interesting to do one day. So um, Holborn, that was specifically at my request. So it's, it is Spanish Holborn. It is literally that area of London where all this, all, all everything on this, um, this session falls into. A couple of hundred yards from the hotel is the rather splendid Sicilian Avenue. And it was down here that there used to be a shop. That shop was the Fantasy Book Centre, not to be confused with the later Fantasy Centre. This was originally located, located in the Stoke Newington district of North East London. At one point, Vince Clark worked there. The difficulty in commuting eventually leading him to move into a flat with Ken Bulmer that became known as the Epicenter. In the summer of 1949, Vince took proprietor Frank Parker along to a Thursday night meeting at the Globe, where he got talking with Ted Carnell. Carnell was looking to relaunch New Worlds, which had ceased publication in 1947 after just three issues. The two teamed up, Parker's business acumen enabling that relaunch to take place. When the 1952 Fantasy Book Centre catalogue was published, the shop was still at an address in Stoke Newington. By early 1953, it had relocated to number 10 Sicilian Avenue. We know this because Parker put an ad in the programme book for that year's Eastercon. The business was eventually taken over by Les Flood and continued up through the 1960s. As can be seen from the wall behind Les, the shop also dealt in records. As that decade progressed, the SF side of the business dwindled and its name was eventually changed to Books and Music. It was actually the white horse that uh, Vince took Frank Parker along to, my my error there. Um, If you want to find out more about London SF bookstores, there's actually an article in uh, an issue of Peter Wesson's Relapse online that you can go into that in some depth. The uh, Fantasy Book Centre wasn't our first dedicated SF business in this country. That was the, that was the science fiction service that was run by um, out of Liverpool and London by Ted Carnell and Les Johnson, which is um, more of a um, mail order thing to begin with. Although it did, it did later have a shop in, on two separate occasions in Liverpool. A few yards from Sicilian Avenue is Southampton Row. And up in Southampton Row, we will find the Bonnington Hotel. And the Bonnington Hotel is that big building up there. Let's get a bit closer. This is the Bonnington Hotel, site of Coroncon, the 1953 Eastercon, and also the birthplace of Taff. It's now called, as you'll see, the Double Tree, but you can't disguise all that name in the stonework.
Taff, the transatlantic fan fund, came about as the result of an offer from Don Ford and the Cincinnati Fantasy Group. In 1949, Ted Carnell had been the beneficiary of a special fund that took him to the Worldcon, held that year in Cincinnati. Here's a photo Ted took of three of the Cincinnati Fantasy Group, Stan Skirvin, B. Mahaffey, and Roy Lavender. A few years later, the group conceived a similar fund to bring UK fan Norman Ashfield to the 1953 Philcon. When Ashfield declined, they offered UK fandom the funds already collected as seed money towards sending a fan of our choice to the US. However, during discussions at the con, it was decided that rather than a one-off fund, the money should be used to establish an ongoing one, hence TAF. Coroncon was so named because 1953 was the year of Queen Elizabeth II's coronation. B. Mahaffey attended after first visiting fans in Belfast and was much photographed. No, really, she's in a large number of the photos we have from that con. A surprise attendee was L. Ron Hubbard, who walked in off the street unexpectedly one afternoon. As a big-name American author, he was immediately roped into giving a talk, which he did. No tape of this exists, but he reportedly stuck to science fiction. It was the only time he ever attended a convention in the UK. Right. Um, so, here are, here's Irish fandom, plus Chuck Harris, who was kind of um, the co-editor of, uh, although a bit later, the co-editor of Hyphen. Eric Bencliffe, Manchester fan. Um, oh, and there's me. So, any questions from anybody? The uh, Bonington is a lovely hotel, but we never ever went back there because I assume, as with most London hotels, it got too expensive. We haven't uh, we haven't had a, ho a convention in in the middle of London for decades, which is why when there's a London convention now, it's always at Heathrow except for the Worldcom where we spent a lot of money and we had it at that big, uh, that big center in Docklands. Right, questions? Yeah, Joey's got a question. Uh, yes, I'm wondering if you have any estimate of how many times you have done this tour totally, because you did it with me, I believe in 1989 on my first trip and maybe uh -huh. 92, but I think it was 89. And when I just saw the picture of the Bonington, I was like, Rob took me there. And, yep. and, and I'm really, you know, it's like I know the from 2014, but do you have any kind of gut level feel how many times you've done this? Because your preparation is fabulous. Probably seven or eight times by this point, because I did it, I did it twice at the Worldcon. Right. I think I did it, what was it, three times? Because I, I actually ended up taking um, Kurt by himself because he wasn't able to make the earlier ones. And in fact, when it came to the Worldcon, um, the committee originally said to me, do you want to put this as a, an item in the program book? And I said, Christ, no, because I was worried. <laughs> I was worried that if I end up with a lot of people and I end up with a lot of people on the pavement behind me, if somebody gets struck by a car, which would be you know, extremely likely because pavements are fairly narrow, it would all get fairly messy. So I figured just word of mouth via the usual fanish channels would produce a reasonable number, and it did. They were fairly decent sized groups to take for a walk. Whereas if I'd have had 50 at a time or something, that would have been a bit fraught, I think. So yeah, I think um, the number of times I've done this, I'd say seven or eight by this point. It, it, you sound like you've done it hundreds of times, but very smooth in a good way, in a good way. <laughs> Well, it, it's, it's been six years since I last did it, so I'm a bit, I'm a bit rusty. Yeah, okay. It's Thanks. the noise. Yes. Whoever is squeaking, please mute. Uh, I think there's a question from Kurt. Hi, Rob. It's Kurt Phillips here. And uh, that, Hello, private, yes, that private tour you gave me uh, the day after the World Con was terrific. I think uh, actually Mark and Claire were with us on that one, too. <clears throat> but that was the uh, highlight of my, uh, my convention right there. Oh, well, thank you. Yeah, I think you're right. I think Mark and Claire were with us. Because what had happened was you'd been too busy to make any, either of the other ones. So therefore, you know, you were a TAF right. winner. So of course right. I was going to take you on a tour. I mean, it's every time a TAF winner, well, perhaps not the younger ones, but certainly our generation, any time uh, a TAF winner came till, through London, I usually ended up giving them the tour. Usually mm -hmm. with one or two other people as well, because why not? You're coming to, you know, uh, it's all, it's all about being an ambassador, so. Well, it's very much appreciated. Uh, I have a question about B. Mahaffey. Was she over yes. uh, just for the convention, or did she have other things going on uh, in Europe at that time, too? Uh, professional business stuff, publishing stuff? I don't know. I mean, when, when, um, 
when Ted Cannell went over in 49, she was still at that point just a fan. But of course, by the time 53 rolls around, she's the editor of, was it Other Worlds? Yes. And, uh, I'm sure. I'll oh, show you yeah. So that at that time, yes, she was both a pro and a fan. So my so I actually don't know the conditions under which she came over at all. Though I've always been amused by the fact that um, fans of the time, for reasons best known to themselves, decided that they would give her um, a kind of, what's what I'm looking for? Um, not a convoy, but a, she would be escorted to, um, she was going to... Um, through London to catch, I think, a ferry or something. So they had motorcycle outriders either side of the car and kind of you know, took it through London with the full, you know, the full thing. And of course, because there's all the um, all the stuff for the um, for the coronation there, there's bunting and all manner of other stuff. I wish we'd had a video of it. That would have been highly entertaining. <laughs> did B go over by herself, or was uh, did she travel with somebody from America? No, she went by herself. She went via Ireland first of all, and uh, obviously stayed with the uh, Irish fans. Hence that lovely picture of her with um, with um, James White, which actually was taken in the garden of Eric Frank Russell's house in Liverpool, because she huh. they came, they used to travel across from Belfast to Liverpool by boat. Then very few of them actually flew on the so they came across on the ferry. And of course, Eric Frank Russell lived in uh, Liverpool, and he and Walt Willis got on quite well. So they called in on um, on Willis, and Eric Frank Russell was quite happy to meet B. Mahaffey, as most people were. So that went down very well. Thank you. I think we have uh, something from Rob Jackson, and then that was sure. the last of the questions. Rob? Hi, Rob. Uh, oh, hi, Rob. Um, just uh, this is sort of slightly later on, but again, Central London related. I uh, I was on the bidding committee for a, 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 an 83 Easter Con in Central London called Metrocon, but I'm afraid I can't remember the name of the hotel that we lined up. We lost out fairly right. narrowly. They bid for um, Albacon too. Uh, I think Rob, the the Harveys will also on that uh, that bid committee, if I remember rightly. But uh, but it all sort of faded out. Uh, it so was that's, very yeah. So that's forty years ago. Was the last time anybody even attempted to put on a, a convention in you know in central London because it's just too expensive. Yes, the the hotel was. I think not not that uh, posh, but it was uh, uh, it was just about affordable. But I think the combination of a, of a not terribly cheap hotel and uh, and possibly not not terribly brilliant uh, facilities uh, was uh, enough to sway people in favour of Albacon too, because Albacon was already a known a known entity. They'd already run Albacon one in 1980. Makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, in the early 80s, we kind of went back and forth between about three different locations, didn't it? It was, it was always yep. Glasgow, Brighton, or Leeds, and we kept bouncing between the three of them for a, quite a large number of years. Yep. yep. Coming further along Southampton Road brings us to the Royal National Hotel. All that's held to this day, these days of fanish interest is the semi-monthly Comic Mart, but this is the site of the previous Royal Hotel that hosted the 1951 1952 and 1970 Easter cons. In all but name, the international convention held at the Royal Hotel in 1951 was the first Eurocon, featuring as it did fans from many European countries. It was almost that in name too, given that one of the names originally proposed for it was Yukon. In the event, it eventually became known as Festivention, 1951 being the year of the Festival of Britain. As well as being our first international con, it was also the first to be held in a hotel. A number of American fans attended, including Forrest Ackerman and Lee Jacobs. First Invention was also the first convention at which the International Fantasy World was presented. The trophy consisted of a metal rocket ship on a wooden base. The rocket ship had wings, but aside from this, it bore a strong resemblance to the later Hugo Award. At the 1952 convention, no other discontent with London's hold on the national convention became apparent with the launch of a bid to hold the following one in Manchester. Ultimately, this was voted down, despite the misgivings of those worried about the potential problems in holding a con in London during coronation year. There was also a spoof bid, which Walt Willis presented with the slogan, Gay Paris in 53. The problems facing PsyCon, the 1970 Easter con, were entirely different. George Hay was a man known more for his sweeping enthusiasm than for his practicality. 
When he launched his one-man bid at the previous year's convention, he did so without having secured a hotel. Alarm bells ringing for them, Bill Burns and Derek Bram Stokes stepped in to handle the practical side of things, leaving George to concentrate on programming. The problem they faced was that by 1970 there were no longer affordable hotels to be found in central London. After a lot of hunting, they found the Royal, which was scheduled to be demolished and so able to offer acceptable rates ahead of its appointment with the Wrecking Ball. It was, not surprisingly, pretty shabby by this point. James Blish was guest of honour, but George Hayes' programme was not as heavily SF-based as usual and included a lot of fringe stuff that reflected his particular interests. There was some discontent at this, and Psycon is not remembered fondly by many. But under the circumstances, perhaps the most remarkable thing about the con was that it happened at all. That picture there of Ken Chapman in the International Fantasy Award, you'll see that it had wings. Um, in much the same way that the standard Hugo looks like a V2, that one looked like a winged V2, of which there actually were some. 1951 was the first con attended by the Belfast fans. That's the Willises, Bob Shaw, James White, George Charters. And when representatives of each attending country were asked to give a few words on their fandom, Walt, unable to think of anything else, told the con about a pocketbook published in Gaelic. Um, with regard to the, let's see, the 19, 1970, um, James Blish ended up being the guest of honor, but originally it was supposed to be Brian Aldis. However, George Hay, seeing um, that Blish was available, a bigger name, he actually kind of brought, uh, brought Blish in, which was a bit naughty. You'll see here that there's a post-con report that's something we used to do back in the day. The very first convention over here in 1937, the report was a, a report on the proceedings rather than a program book. The Royal Hotel, ah, there we are, the Royal Hotel Lounge. It actually didn't look too bad inside, but it was obviously very, very sh shabby. You might be slightly confused by the Royal Hotel and the Royal National Hotel in that they don't look that different on the outside, but I suspect that's because they just had to fit in with the surrounding buildings. So when the, uh, when the Royal Hotel was demolished because the inside was so low standard and they built the new hotel externally they don't look that different we're now on barnard street a short distance from the royal Ho hotel takes us to russell square tube station and then as we pan down a bit further down there is number 25 number 25 barnard street is where morris k hansen lived when he first moved to london several of the latest issues of nova terror were published in this address. Hansen and fellow Nuneaton fan Denny Jacks had launched Nova Terra in March 1936. It was the UK's first fanzine. At that point, it was the journal of their club, Chapter 22 of the Science Fiction League, an organisation sponsored by Wonder Stories. With the launch of the Science Fiction Association at the January 1937 convention in Leeds, it became the journal of that organisation instead. Hansen moved to London from Nuneaton in late 1937, bringing Nova Terra with him. He would live at the Bernard Street address until invited to move to the famous flat. I mistakenly called this Barnard Street in the video clip, but it was Bernard. Yes, not Bernard, any more than Morris K. Hansen was Maurice. It seems incredible to us today that young fans on junior salaries could afford to live in central London. But back then, it was a far less appealing prospect. This was before the Clean Air Act and the famous London fogs of yore were actually smog. Hansen would be the first UK fan to be called up for military service, eventually heading for France with the British Expeditionary Force. This means he was a Dunkirk, one of three British fans we know of for sure who were. The others were Ron Fishwick and Stanley Davis. Davis suffered shell shock and a broken back and died a few months after the evacuation. Stanley Davis was a member of the Manchester Interplanetary Society. Uh, that was a group of about only about 10 people strong, and they lost somebody else during the war as well, which was a guy named Trevor Cusack, who died while serving in the Merchant Navy. So that means that this was a group that lost 20% of their members, by far the highest uh, loss during World War II, because fandom as a whole, we didn't have many deaths or even that many injuries. We actually got off fairly lightly, I think, which is a good thing, obviously. So the last fan to die in Europe that I'm aware of was actually an American named Earl Kay, who died literally in the closing days of the World War II. Um, he'd all, he was already back in the US and in April 1945, 
for in somewhat mysterious circumstances, asked to be reassigned to carry out a specific mission. And uh, he died doing so. There's a section on his called Earl Kay's last mission on my website for those of you who want to look into that any further. Because it is uh, it is slightly intriguing, somewhat puzzling that he should, you know, go go when it was all winding down and end up getting himself killed. Any questions? Jerry had a question from the previous section. Oh, Jerry. sure. Yeah. 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 Um, so there was one picture, and I'm sorry I don't remember the people, but it was a man and his wife was identified and his mistress was identified. Oh, and yes. I believe that was the early 50s. And yep. what I was wondering, was it publicly known at the time? And, you know, it's like now it's really common in, in fandom to, you know, there's a lot of polyamory, but I don't associate it that with that era. So well, that was, that was Bert Campbell. Um, and yes, I assume it was known because it, it, it's come down to me. And I mean, it's not as if I've looked into these people, but then there were all manner of things that were known that, you know, people didn't much worry about. I mean, there were something like uh, two or three uh, fans who were known homosexuals that nobody cared about. The fact that they were fans is what counted, not the fact that they were gay. Um, Terrific. So, and again, the uh, fandom was all fandom was always slightly bohemian, even though we didn't back then didn't necessarily address relatively conservatively. It's always been a little bit um, freewheeling, I think. Thank you. Okay. Walk back down Southampton Row, turn left on Theobalds Road, and a few minutes' walk will bring you to Lamb's Conduit Street. So we come to Lamb's Conduit Street. The film watchers among you may recognize this police station from the movie Kingsman. It's where Colin Firth's character meets Eggsy. From our point of view, what's significant about this building is it stands on the same corner as the ancient order of Druids Memorial Hall did. Site of the 1938 and 1939 conventions, the second and third conventions ever held in this country. The inaugural meeting of the London branch of the SFA was held in Catford at the 11 Clouders Road home of Eric Williams on Sunday, October 3rd, 1937. 18 fans attended, more than were present at the Leeds Convention in January. It was agreed here that future meetings should be held every month at a public venue. The first of these meetings took place the following month on Sunday, November 7th, 1937 in the Ancient Order of Druids Memorial Hall. Having established a relationship with Druids Hall, it was only natural that Londoners would choose it as the venue for the second and third UK conventions in 1938 and 1939, respectively. I've never been able to locate a photograph of Druids Hall as it was, but I do have one taken in the aftermath of its destruction. This shows the pile of rubble that was all that was left after it was struck by a bomb during an air raid on the night of May 10th, 1941. So there you go. Um, the Ancient Order of Druids were an outfit I was never able to find that much out about, but um, from descriptions of the conventions, um, those two conventions were held in the shadow of a papier-mâché replica of Stonehenge, because this is obviously what they, you know, tied into the Druidic thing, even though we now know that the Druids were like thousands of years after Stonehenge was built. To this day, at the real Stonehenge, on the summer solstice, you have Druids prancing about among the stones. In fact, um, I think it was Milton Keynes, where they decided to build a concrete replica of Stonehenge. And various locals were worried that this would attract Druids until someone pointed <laughs> out to them, this is a concrete replica. It's, there's no actual significance whatsoever. The last, I, I did try and look into the ancient order of Druids at one point, try and find out what I could about them. And all I found out is that weirdly enough, uh, the last address I had for them was at a place, just one stop down the line from where I live now. But what happened to them, no idea. So that's them. Yeah, any questions? Yes, um, there are a number of Druids Hall throughout England. Are they related to each other? Do you know? It's, it's entirely possible. As I say, I did, it wasn't something I went into deeply. I was just a bit curious as to what had happened to them within, you know, within London. But uh, I'm, I'm wondering if it's something like the Masons and the Water Buffaloes and that kind of thing. But then again, the papier-mâché copy of Stonehenge that... Uh, that science fiction conventions were held amid, which is a really weird image, suggests that perhaps they were a bit more serious than just, you know, the Masons in terms of possible paganism. Walk down Lamb's Conduit Street, turn right on Rugby Street, and you come to the Rugby Tavern. 
This is one of many pubs that have hosted the meetings of the Hatton Group over the years. Held every Thursday of the month other than the first, these are entirely informal. Continuing along Northington Street brings you to the Lady Ottoline. When we met there, it was called the King's Arms and had the tiniest pub toilets I've ever encountered. Going up John Street brings you back to Theobald's Road. Turn left and on the next corner, you'll encounter the Yorkshire Grey, yet another former Hatton Group watering hole. Our moves were almost always forced on us by the pub converting to a wine bar or, more usually, by the arrival of a young bar staff who cranked up the music to a level where conversation became impossible. And there you go. The Hatton Group, which you wouldn't have got to yet, was, is basically me, Owen White Oak, and several other peoples over the years. I mean, at one point, Avenue used to come along, but she's not uh, mobile enough anymore. And it's basically just going for a drink in a pub every Thursday other than the first Thursday. And weirdly enough, we've been doing that for like a third of a century now. So... It's a, given that it's, it's given there's no doubt that two or three blokes drinking at the table in a pub still calling ourselves an actual fan group seems a bit iffy, but there you go. It's continuity. We do occasionally even discuss science fiction, but not that often. Crossing Theobald's Road, you don't have to walk too far down Gray's Inn Road before you come to number 88, a.k.a. The Flat. Arthur C. Clarke and Bill Temple rented an apartment here from June 1938. This occupied the top two floors. The flat was soon made the official headquarters of the British Interplanetary Society and the venue for the monthly meetings of its London branch. It also became a magnet for visiting fans. An early visitor was Morris Hansen, then still living in his Bernard Street bedsit. He was invited to join Clark and Temple and became the flat's third occupant. Temple later wrote a novel based on the trio's time there called Three Men in a Flat. Extracts of this later appeared in Hyphen. Since it was never pointed out that this was a fictionalised rather than a purely factual account, some confusion has been caused by these over the years. Unable to get his manuscript published, Temple later reworked it into a shorter novel titled Bachelor Flat, also unpublished. Later still, he shortened it again and it finally appeared in the eponymous collection of his work, 88 Gray's Inn Road. In his introduction to that volume, Clark suggested that local authorities should attach one of their blue plaques to it, as seen here to commemorate its historic significance. Hansen's arrival meant that Nova Terra, the SFA's official organ, was now published out of the flat. So, naturally enough, Temple joined the editorial team. Almost immediately, it became looser and less serious. Hansen had tended to pomposity in his editorials, but this was soon knocked out of him, and Nova Terra began to print the type of material familiar to readers of modern fanzines. Soon the flat would provide the SFA with more than just an editorial office for its official meetings, for its official organ, however. On Thursday, 18th August, London SFA moved their weekly meetings from Jay Lyons to the flat, a move that proved very popular. On the corner of the block containing the flat is where the Red Bull used to stand until it was destroyed in a bombing raid. The Red Bull was the first London pub fans ever gathered in on Thursday evenings. Those at weekly SFA meetings tended to split into two factions. The teetotalers, headed by Clark and Hansen, staying in the flat for the meeting. The others, such as Ken Chapman, Frank Arnold, Temple and Carnell, adjourned to the Red Bull for well-lubricated conversation. At closing time, both parties joined again in the flat for chips and chat until the last trains left. On the 16th of April 1941, a bombing raid took out the Red Bull and damaged the flat. Four weeks later, another raid reduced Druid's Hall to rubble. In October, while on army leave, Bill Temple visited Gray's Inn Road. In his diary, he recorded the following. Of the Red Bull, that much frequented pub of the SFA, where we, we were to meet again after the war, only a pitiful column and a cross piece remained, with the Red Bull inscribed upon it. It looked like the remains of a Grecian temple. The flat seemed untenanted, and we mounted the shaky stairs and found it was so. All the rooms, including the flat, were full of broken glass and plaster and splintered wood. We used to boast that if you stood on a chair in the bathroom, you could see St. Paul's. You didn't need a chair now. You had a fine view of it through the glassless windows. All the intervening buildings seemed to have been knocked down and you gazed at it rising out of a waste of ruins. At the bottom of Gray's Inn Road, at the junction with High Holborn, lies Chancery Lane Underground Station. It was here, on the escalators, that the BIS tested an inertia-governed altimeter. This was one of a number of instruments for its proposed moonship that were constructed at the flat. So there you go. The flat is um, was an, um, significant for both the British Interplanetary Society and the SFA. Here's one of the fanzines that was published there. That's 
Nova Terra from 82 years ago. Uh, one of the editors, of course, being Arthur C. Clarke for that particular issue. So yeah, an important, an important address. And I think we should have a blue plaque on it. Um, one or two people have suggested this over the years, but it, we haven't actually moved on it at all. So we'll see, possibly one day. Any questions? David? So amazing stuff, Rob, thank you. Um, so that you mentioned this proposed moonship. Um, did they write about that? Are there fanzine articles about that that we could look up that would uh, describe more of that activity? Yeah, the Brit pre-war, the British Interplanetary Society and fandom were pretty much the same people. Um, after the war, they kind of went their separate ways to a large extent, but there's still some overlap. Um, so the British Interplanetary Society still exists. They do technical journals. Um, they have a library going back decades, which I've occasionally done research in. Um, and I'm now on their, uh, I've been, I've been seconded onto their history group because they're trying to put together an, a history of their pre-war, um, what they did pre-war, which obviously I, I have some input into. Uh, as for their moonship, whether it's online or not, I don't know, but they certainly, they certainly had plans over the years. And so, yeah, you'd have to follow that up probably with the BIS. Um, so maybe in one of their journals of which I have some, so I'll, be, I'll yeah, be well, see yeah. if I can find something, yeah. Yeah, pretty well. They also were. They also just. They went from a moonship to a starship in the early seventies, and they worked on all manner of um, propo proposals, etc. Because, well, obviously, while they they weren't in the position to launch rockets themselves, they were in a position because of the technical people they had to do lots and lots of calculations. So they came up with lots and lots of plans, etc. Um, and indeed, I think most of those are still available if you can find out where. I could put you in touch with the um, current chairman of the BIS, which was Jerry Webb. If you want to drop me an email, because uh, you know he's a he's a buddy, so he probably he could probably tell you you know how you find that kind of stuff. Excellent, thank you. I appreciate that. Welcome, Stephen. Okay, uh, Rob, you mentioned the uh, earliest meetings taking place at the Red Bull uh, in the '30s, and you also mentioned that there were the Thursday night meetings taking place on the two tea shops over on New Oxford Street, also in the '30s. Yeah, the, the the tea shops are where they started. It started in the tea shops first of all. Mm -hmm. Then it moved to the, uh, then they had their official meetings were in the ancient order of druids because they had an official meeting as well as the casual meeting. And then the casual meetings, you know, kind of the social meetings, then moved to the flat. And it was because the flat was where, um, you know, uh, Clark and, uh, and Temple lived that they then started drinking because it was down on the corner of the building in the Red Bull. And that's okay, so how the, the Red Bull ended. It was the very first pub that London fans drank in. Okay, so it wasn't a progression from one to the next. Yeah, it was a progression for one of the X. Started in, started in the uh, coffee shop stroke tea rooms, and then you know, it eventually ended up in the, uh, the Red Bull, which is our first ever pub we drank in on Thursday nights. A proud tradition we keep up to this very well, up until March anyway, because no one's gone drinking since then. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Once upon a time, this was the Melton Mowbray, in whose cellar the first Thursday meetings were held from 2006 to 2015, at which point it closed to become a wine bar and renamed itself the Inn of Court. And I have nothing much to say about that. We just went there and had our meetings. Ah, so anybody want to add anything at all about the Melton Mowbray? We actually drank there a long time. It was down in the cellar and it was a perfectly pleasant venue, but as I said, they decided to turn themselves into a wine bar. And while fans like alcohol, wine, not so much. Um, well, all right, there are some, I was going to say winos, that's the wrong term, isn't it? Wine enthusiasts among um, fans, but uh, not among the general, the general herd of fans, should we say. On this corner until 1983 stood the White Horse, famed home for many a year of the London Circle, where they met every Thursday. The mythical White Hart pub of Arthur C. Clarke's Tales from the White Hart was based on the White Horse. Its regulars appeared in those tales thinly disguised behind various pseudonyms. London's SF fan pro community met here from April 1946 to the 3rd of December 1953. At that point, the pub's barman and Lou Mordecai transferred to a different pub, The Globe, and it was decided to make the move with him. In the 1980s, the Hatton Group met in the White Horse for a few months from 10th November 1988. The pub was already scheduled for demolition by that point. Needless to say, it was in a very shabby condition. But, as a consequence, it was quieter and less crowded than nearby alternatives. 
Our final meeting at the White Horse was on the 13th of April, 1989. A few days after this, Abbott and Carol and I flew to the US to attend the 1989 core flu in Minneapolis. When next we saw the White Horse on the 11th of May, it was boarded up. Its name and all signage had been removed. It was demolished soon after this. We had thought we were the last fans ever to sup a pint there, but Sandra Bond later revealed that she had called in for one while we were in the US, thus stealing that honor from us. The White Horse used to stand on the corner of Fetter Lane and Norwich Street. The new building erected on that site included a basement bar named Walkers of Hoban. The first Thursday meetings were held here through much of 2005 until it closed in order to be redeveloped as a wine bar. Today, Walkers is no more. The space it occupied having been absorbed into the office building, so this may not have been the best of ideas. Yes, that made me smile a bit. I thought, well, you know, there you are, you buggers. If you'd have kept it a pub, we might actually still, it might actually still exist. Um, as for the White Horse, one thing I didn't mention was that the 1948 convention, our first post-war convention, was held in a room, the room above the bar. Um, Bertram Chandler was the guest of honor. It was a one day affair. Most of the, a lot of the photos you've seen here of people outside the pub were taken in the late forties and may have been taken actually at that event. Who the, uh, right. Who those previous people and the people in the previous photo were, I have no idea. I suspect they were foreign fans who was visiting. And there's Lou Mordecai, the famous, uh, here we are again, back outside the, uh, the white horse. Famous faces from the forties. Ted Carnell looking natty as ever. He'd really like bow ties. Not that common among fans. Ted Tubb. And that's down on the far corner. That's the one, the uh, white horse again. Again, late 40s. More, uh, well, they were all pros, I think, at that time. Although I don't actually know who Dave Griffiths is. 1953, that's going to be um, the Corran Con again. That was in the meeting before the con proper. Again, there's those people who look like French people to me, but who knows? So conceivably they were there for it as well. And again, if Bima Happy's in the picture, that's a 53. So that's again, Coron Con. Vince Clark in the background. Again, Irish fandom, Bima Happy. Norman Shorrock between uh, Walt and James. And there's me. Right, any questions? We have one from yeah. John Coxon. All right. Hey, I, I have two questions. Um, ah, firstly, okay. yes. Which pub is it that gave the tun its name? Because I know the Melton Mowbray coincidentally has tun in it, but I know it's not the original. No, the tun came from the one tun pub. So we call. So we, for a long time, the meetings were called the Globe because they were at the Globe. When we moved to the, the to the one tun, we just called it the tun. And then we ended up moving to a pub called the Wellington. So we carried on calling it the Tun. And so because the name had carried across, there is still, you know, some of us to this day still refer to it as the Tun, even though we haven't met in a pub with Tun in the name for decades by this point, I suppose. And then secondly, is the Walkers of, uh, is the Walkers of Hoban um, related to the Walkers of St. James? I have no idea. It's conceivable, they I suppose. The Walkers of St. James used to be the regular haunt for meetings after um, you'd go there for a drink after a meeting at the Royal Astronomical Society. So it'd be a neat link um, if it was a related pub. It's gone yeah. now, it's been replaced. Yeah, Linda Denner was asking what pub we met in in 1979. That was actually would have been the one turn because we didn't move from the one turn until 83. We also have a question from Kurt. Oh, Kurt. Rob, that photo of uh, Bert Tubb we saw a few moments ago, him standing next to the car, he seems unusually tall in that photograph. Was he a very tall fellow? He was fairly tall, yes. Um, so, I mean, he was he was actually the last of those old guys to die. He, he lived into his 90s. Um, again, because I was able to, I actually went to his funeral, and it turns out I was the only person from the uh, fan pro community who did turn up. Several others said they would have had they known. Um, but in terms of the fan community, he'd outlived all, all his uh, contemporaries. So there was no way any of them were going to show up. So there you go. Anybody else? Well, there's no. one from Doug. Oh, Doug. 
the Florence Nightingale. The Florence Nightingale would have been, well, uh, I don't know. Help, help me out here, Mark. That would have been 83-ish, something like that. Now, this was uh, spring of 2002. Really? Uh, it was late. Okay. Just, just went, and, and, and they hadn't been there long and weren't going oh, to yeah. be there long. Uh, yeah. And then we went upstairs. We had a great time. But is that is that the same Thursday group that's being discussed? Yeah, it's exactly the same meeting, yeah. The, the Florence Nightingale, if I recall correctly, was off by itself, and it eventually ended up being demolished. We went there, for, we, we drank in it for several years. We moved, and then we came back briefly, I think. Um, again, if you want to check my web page, there's actually a, com a complete comprehensive history of where and when London fandom has met. It's actually on Dave Langford's site, but there's a link on, on, the, on the page on my, my site. Uh, wonderful. Thank you. Yes, again, Fred, it, yeah, 1971, that would have been the Globe, because we moved, as I say, the last meeting was uh, 74, which yeah, we'll, we'll get on to that. That's a bit later on in this video. Directly back across High Holborn from Fetter Lane lies Leather Lane, on which stands a block with a lot of Fanish history. On this block once stood Gamage's department store, in whose printing department Ted Carnell once worked. <clears throat> Further along you'll see the Sir Christopher Hatton pub. It was in the cellar bar of the Sir Christopher Hatton that the Van Hattonites, or the Hatton group if that's what you would call us, were first formed in 1988. The first to actually gather in the Christopher Hatton were refugees from the one town. At the height of their popularity, town meetings may well have been the <coughs> regular gatherings of fans outside of cons anywhere in the world. It became hard to move inside and impossible to talk shop, so the SF pros used to slip away to the Hatton. A short way along from the Christopher Hatton is the Argyle pub, or as it was formerly known, the King of Diamonds. It was upstairs in this pub back in the early 80s that the monthly BSFA meetings were held until the landlord decided to throw us out. The reason for us being thrown out was the campaign for nuclear disarmament. Many fans at that time were also members of CND. Seeing us wearing badges, discussing marches and the like, the landlord decided we were political activists who had hired the upstairs room under false pretenses. There were a lot of fans at the time involved in fan groups, um, and needless, uh, involved in CND groups. And needless to say, they very often put out the publications. I mean, Joseph Nicholas used to put out something called uh, Ground Zero News for Pimlico CND. Uh, Malcolm Edwards was a member of a publisher's group, uh, whose name I've forgotten, who were uh, all people involved in publishing who, uh, who were wanted to be, they wanted to put out a publication at one point. Um, it, it greatly amused Malcolm that there were all these people who were pros in the publishing industry. None of them had any idea how to put out a leaflet for this group. So Malcolm, of course, being a fan, he said, well, you know, putting out a, a four page leaflet was just child's play to somebody who'd been in fandom. So he took, he took it on, obviously. In this corner once stood the Globe Tavern. And there's the King of Diamonds. That corner is on the same block as the King of Diamonds, but further down Gravel Street at the junction with Hatton Garden. Fans gathered at the Globe on Thursdays, first weekly, then monthly, from 10 December 1953 until 12 June 1974. The switch from a weekly to a monthly schedule took place in 1959, and London fans have been meeting on the first Thursday of the month ever since. An extra, non-first Thursday meeting, was arranged to greet Isaac Asimov on his only visit to the UK. This was the last ever meeting at the Globe, the whole block it was on being scheduled for demolition. Right. Ah, excellent. Well done, Bill. This photo you'll see Ellis Mills in, uh, Ameri American fan, which puts that in either 56 or 57. Uh, again, these are all going to be in the 50s. For, yep, all 50s. Um, nothing much to say about it, but you can see Ted's height there since somebody commented on that earlier. He was a tall bloke. Helen Winnick was somebody who tried to actually start a, 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 an actual club in London for fans, but it never came to anything, unfortunately. That would be called the Space Club. Uh, Brian Berry, Lou Mordecai, Peter Phillips, who was a, used to write for the magazines. A globe scene, fairly crowded, though not as crowded as the one ton used to get because they didn't have hooies and trekkies then. Again, 59. This all seems to be locals. Ah, 59. 
and we got visitors from Germany, etc. So that might see the 59 con was in Birmingham, so that obviously wasn't associated with any convention. And Bill and Eileen Butler, who took over the Globe after Lou Mordecai retired. Again, more pictures in the Globe. Nothing particularly to say. And again, more, and nothing particularly to say about them. It's interesting that Sam Ude kind of came along for as long as he did, as he eventually moved to, I think it was Jersey. No, yeah, Jersey. And there's an early picture of Inchmary fandom, though I don't think they were probably Inchmary fandom. Ah, right, Asimov's visit. Asimov travelled across by boat. He arrived on the SS France on the 5th of June, 1974. Um, on the 10th, he had meetings with the press during the day. Tuesday the 11th, a lecture at King's College. Wednesday the 12th, book signings, and that's when he came to the Globe in the evening, which is when all these pictures were taken. Um, the following day, he went up to Birmingham, more book signings, and he lectured the Birmingham group at the Holiday Inn. That was a ticketed event. On Friday the 14th, he was interviewed by Parkinson for TV and did a public lecture uh, organized by Mensa and the SF Foundation, eventually sailing home on the QE2 on the Sunday. As a, in that picture, the man with the pint is Jerry Webb. Lots of pictures outside the globe. As with the uh, one turn, we used to spill out onto the pavement a lot. Globe a bit before my time, so it wasn't a pub I ever actually visited, which is a shame. I would like to have gone to that. Um, there we go again. You've got Gerald Bishop over on the left, Andrew Stevenson over on the right, and in the middle, that was uh, Hazel Reynolds. Those pictures, I think, were all taken by Dave Rowe. Any questions? The, uh, his publisher put out a special brochure that was uh, at the time as well, that covered all that, which is how, how I know about it. Crossing Hatton Garden and continuing down Greville Street, you eventually come to the junction with Saffron Hill, where the next place to host first Thursday meetings is to be found. And now we come to the one turn. Once home to the first Thursday meetings. So many people used to come here that we would often spill out onto the pavement outside. We met in the one turn from July 1974 to January 1987. Many a fanzine contribution was commissioned here and convention business transacted. This was also where Malcolm Edwards presented Dave Langford with the first of his many Hugo Awards. When my fan history tour group washed up here in August 2014, the pub looked much as it, much as it had done back in the day, but not anymore. The interior of the one turn bears no resemblance whatsoever to the pub that I used to drink in 40 odd years ago. In that far corner there used to be the stairs that led up to the toilet. I mean this is, looks like a completely different pub but you know that's life. What now follows is an awful lot of pictures from the uh, outside the one turn. Uh, I have nothing particularly to say about most of these, so if you want to chip in with questions as we go through, please feel free to do so. Uh, Edie? Rob, this have... is, uh, I think, where we met you. It is. Yes, it was. 1983, on you, your first visit over here. So yeah, it's weird that, that you know, we, as you say, we, we actually physically met in that building and then in 2014, that's where the, where the tour of Tiki on all ended. Uh, Joy Herbert, yes. Long gone now. Arthur Cruttenden with the striped sleeves. Again, you'll notice a lot of these pictures are actually outside. We really did used to go out, end up outside a lot. This was fine in the summer, not so much fun in the winter. As I say, if rather a lot of these pictures. Ah, Mike Glickson, me and Avedon. I look taller there than I am purely because those two are short. Yeah, Dave Wood was actually, I think, a Bristolian at that point. And there's Frank Arnold in the foreground. Me back when I had hair. Long gone, sadly. Again, outside on the pavement. A lot of photographs taken in front of that wall. Dave Roy and Arthur Atom. 
Dave Rowley and Elder, they were, ah, there we go. Summer of 1984. Seemed to have a lot of pictures from that summer for some peculiar reason. But then that was also my TAF trip. Aha. Just, uh, there we go again. Mal Ashworth obviously was a Northern fan. Uh, I think he was, I'm trying to remember where he was. Uh, Manchester, Leeds. The Ashworths. After uh, Mal died, Hazel got together with Don West. Uh, this is 84, Arthur died in 1990, so another six years. You'll know the name Abby Frost. Lynn Morris will be entirely unknown to any of you since she just used to show up at local events in uh, London. And there's Greg Pickersgill. No mistaking that here. And again, the usual mob. There's John Gerald, back when he was a fan before he became a publisher or editor. And again, this was the night I think where um, Malcolm was presented. Well, it is the night Malcolm was presented with his Hugo. There it is. And again, outside when it's raining. The one turned fine outside, but uh, raining did kind of put the dampers on things a bit. And there's me. So, any questions about the one turn? It's obviously one of the pubs I'm most fond of because it was the first pub that I ever went to for the uh, Thursday night drink ups. And when I moved to London, that was, that was it for many years. The 2014 tour finished in the one ton, where tired feet were rested and thirsty throats lubricated. If we had had the stamina, we could have continued on a bit further. Gravel Street continues for a few more yards before terminating at each junction with Farringdon Road. Crossing over this brings you, brings you to Cow Cross Street, where we find the original original Farringdon station, which pretty much everybody going to the town used to come into. The new Farringdon station. Now this is me taking you up the street, basically. Further up the street. We now have to go through Smithfield to get to the next pub. But first, we cross this, which, believe it or not, is a public piss well. This was only used in the summer, as you might imagine. But quite a startling thing to encounter on a London street. Right, this is uh, Smithfield, we're passing through here. Um, Smithfield is London's main wholesale meat market and has been in this location in various forms for over 18 years. This used to be the Barley Mow pub. And the name still exists in the alley on which it's on. And at the top of the building, as you can see there, the Barley Mow Tavern. Right, questions? Yes, I did say 800 years. That's a long time, but uh, you know, this is London. There are things that are old here. The Bishop's Finger is the pub where the first Thursday meetings have been held since April 2016. And there it is, the Bishop's Finger. If it wasn't for COVID, this is where we would be on Thursday nights to this day. Or first Thursdays, rather. So, ah, right, you're back. Um, yeah, there's a question from Joe when you're ready for questions. Yeah, sure, Joe. You mentioned uh, the Barley Mow. Um, yeah. Was that a place for meetings as well? Uh, yeah, I don't remember uh, having that one, uh, reading about that one. That's on the list of London pubs we met at, because after we left the... Um, the one turn, we turned very nomadic for a long time, going on all manner of pubs. That was one of the pubs we met at for a short while, and then we ended up moving a short distance to where we are at the moment. Um, I th I'm trying to remember whether we met on the ground floor in the Barley Mow or not. If we did, it would be the last pub in which we ever did that, because the, you know, even though we're all getting older and it's not um, it's not invalid accessible, I'm afraid if you want to have a pub meeting in London these days, 
stage, you're either going down in this cellar or you're going up on the first floor. There's just no getting around that, unfortunately. So disabled access, sadly, is not one of the things we can, uh, we can provide anymore. Aha. First of all, okay. Any questions, anybody? Do we know what finger the bishop's finger refers to? <laughs> I've no idea. I'm sure somebody will tell tell us what the uh, derivation of that is. It sounds vaguely sexual, doesn't it? But it probably isn't. And uh, Fred Lerner asks, where where is the bishop's finger? It's right next to Smithfield Market. Hence the, you know, the, I took us up from the uh, Farringdon up through up through the um, Smithfield Market, and there's the bishop's finger. Um, and that's as I say where we drink at the moment. I see my map guide shows a lot of pubs, but it doesn't show that particular one. That's why I'm trying to figure out what street it's on. Again, if you find Smithfield Meat Market, it's just outside. It's next next to that circular park. It's okay, a, near near the Distillers Pub. Uh, John Brace just said it's it's a oh, it's a Shep and Neem pub. If that helps, if you do a web search on it, I'm sure you'll you'll find an address for it. I think every every pub has got a website usually these days. Okay. Steve, like you want to? Oh, sorry, go ahead. Sorry, did somebody want to say something? Or Okay. Sunken Circular Road opposite the Bishop's Finger leads to an underground car park. In the James Bond movie Skyfall, it leads to a backup headquarters for MI6. From here, it's about a 10 minute walk to St. Martin Le Grand and to the pub that's the final stop on our tour. And that name's In 1949, our national convention was held in a room above the Lord Raglan pub which, amazingly, is still here. So, again, two years in a row, we were meeting in a room above a pub. Uh, this convention was run under the auspices of the newly formed Science Fantasy Society. Here endeth the tour. Cheers all. <sighs> so as I was saying, that convention was held under the auspices of the then newly formed Science Fantasy Society. That was a short-lived attempt at a new national organization. 60 to 70 people turned up the con. The convention guest of honor was Bill Temple, who laid into the SF Magazine editors of the day in scathing but amusing fashion. The day concluded with a buffet, sorry, buffet, followed by an auction uh, by t run by Charlie Duncombe, which raised the princely sum of 12 pounds for the science fiction, science fantasy society. That doesn't sound a lot, but in today's money, that's about 430 quid. So that was actually quite a decent sum to raise for them. Right, any questions? other than looking longingly at that point, which I very much like one of now, but uh, anybody have anything to say? I've never gone to as many pubs without having a drink. Tell me about uh, it. <laughs> Thank I you mean, for a great tour. Oh, you're welcome. I'm sure if you're Mark, Mark Plummer has probably been drinking away while he's been watching this anyway, but there you go. Well, it's a bit okay. early for that sort of thing here in the east coast of the U.S. Well, define early. I mean, it's all—it's always time to drink somewhere. So, wherever you are, you can say, "Well, it's drinking time there," and show solidarity. So, uh, thank you, Rob. You're very welcome. Uh,